The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the Engine Room Unpacked. I'm Sue Viscovich from Elixir Consulting and I'm thrilled that I get to join your host, Andrew Rocks, to unpack the last five episodes and explore some of the nuggets of absolute gold, brilliant ideas and strategies that you too can deploy to enjoy greater success from your engine room. Let's go. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room. Unpacked. Today, joining me to unpack five fabulous financial planning businesses is Sue Viskovich from Elix Consulting. Good morning, Sue. How are you? Hey, Roxy. I am fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this. When I, when I was, uh, started this process, and you know, with Ensemble, we're all about the positive evolution of financial advice, and specifically, we were talking about practice management. I'm not sure if you were listening. But several of our um, practice managers, I, I definitely know Belinda from uh, Boutique and, and um, uh, um, the Burke Britain team, they were des- in desperate need or desperate desire for a practice manager specific um, course or, or, or a community. Now, we're not going to touch on that straight up, but as it turns out, Elix is doing it, which is why we I reached out. And I thought, well, I, I couldn't possibly have a better guest. So, welcome oh. to the Unpacked. Thank you so much, Roxy. Yeah, real pleasure to be with you. And uh, I must say, I've been loving these uh, this theme uh, of your ensemble podcasts, and just love the different f- firms and the variety that you got there. So there's five great ones that we're going to be talking about today. And uh, yeah, yeah. Ab- a- absolutely. And what I thought we'd do is just to just to give some structure to today's session is yeah. we're going to look at the different businesses, and we're going to run through three key themes. And the first sort of larger thing is, are they running it like a business? Okay. And that might be something like the right people and right roles. And then, you know, the role of the practice manager. The next sort of mega theme is capacity planning. Okay. It's, it's, I think practices over the last three or four years have managed to actually build their engines rooms and just to get a bit of a feel of is there capacity constraints or whatnot. And then finally, once they've got all those right, are they serving their clients better? So once they've taken care of their own affairs, is that actually having a positive reflection on what's delivered to the clients, which at the end of the day are all of our employers? Indeed, uh, they sure are. And look, I, I think it's a great place to start is talking about this aspect of these businesses running it like a business. I mean, we talk a lot around, um, you know, the old ways of running an advice firm and not going to cut it in future. I mean, that's just that's just a, a given. I think everybody knows that. And these five firms, what I was thrilled to see is that there was a lot of variety between them. Um, and I love that you're not saying, "Hey, everyone, every firm that we're going to feature is a firm that wants to take over the world and and uh, you know end up globalizing the advice profession." You're not doing that because you know you and I both know the reality is 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 great businesses are those that are built around unique visions of the people that drive them. Um, and for one person, you know the Ben Nashes of the world, he's got a huge BHAG um, to grow. I don't know a hundred times what he what he is right now. Um, and then for the next practice, in fact, um, we might play a, a quote from this one in particular. And which practice is this one, Sue? This is Moran. Um, oh, yeah, it's Paul and Alex. Great. Paul and Alex, yeah. So it's funny because I had actually written down in my notes from listening to all the others, running it like a business, they're all doing that. And then this particular quote, up, quote came up from Paul Moran. So we might play it. 
that's the thing we do. We, we don't treat this as a business. I mean, I, I have a, a strong view that I'm a practitioner and this is a practice. And that's different to other people. Other people treat their businesses as businesses. Business first, you know, financial planning second. We've always treated this as a practice and we're, we're practitioners first and foremost. And that allows us to focus on our clients and uh, first and foremost and focus on our staff. Um, so so I, we genuinely do treat them like family. We, we, we know their birthdays. We, we go out together. We, you know, we, we, we care for them. You know, we really do care for everyone. And, and I think they know it and they care for us. You know, it works both ways, you know. And so... We 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 cover for each other. We know what's going on. Uh, it's a little tight knit community, and people people like that. You know, we're we're, we're pretty flexible in how we, how we operate. You know, if someone can't come in because they're sick or they've got kids to look after, we just cover it. You know, it's just it's done that way, and it works well together. But but it is you know it is a personal business we're in, and, and the more we try and commercialize it, the less personal it becomes. Well, to us, it's not how we want to operate. So isn't that fascinating? You ended there. The less personal it becomes, the more we commercialize it. So the concepts that I'm kind of talking about here is is to be successful and in whatever definition success is to you, whether it's more profit, whether it's better client relationships, global domination, um, to be successful, you have to really run it like a business. And that doesn't necessarily mean commercializing because I absolutely agree with what Paul's saying there is that a large part of the personality and the success of their firm is they do treat everybody like family. It is about, you know, putting their clients and their people first. You know, I love the way that they describe their business. They've got such a beautiful culture. And at the same time, they also say they haven't documented their culture intentionally. It is just how they roll and who they are. And that personality flows through. And yet, as we discovered, they are all about improving the way they serve their clients. You know, uh, I think Alex used to be an advisor. He now runs the business. He does the, that practice management piece, I believe. I think and he rolls down all- from time to time, but um, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So all of that comes up from their passion to make sure that they can do what they do better. And that is, I think, one of the the core elements of running it like a business. Don't just keep being an advisor and just have the personality and run by the seat of your pants and everybody else has to pick up behind you to maybe deliver a good client service. They very close, clearly looked at exactly how they deliver what they want to deliver to a client and improve it. So much so that um, he invented the iFact Find uh, as a piece of technology that they've now rolled out to the rest of advisors. So, of the, and, fir- and of the you're practice, right. you're absolutely right. And look, you can you can have scale or you can have innovation. And I think when I look at the Moran business and 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 the the two gentlemen who regard us um, there, um, they were early do- early adopters SMA ten years ago. Um, they 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 saw a gap in in fact file, and so so they've been quite innovative. And why I've got this opportunity is probably remiss of me. I probably give the framing up of the practices we're talking about. So clearly, we've kicked off. With, with, that's right. I know. I know. We're so excitable. So we've kicked off with Moran FP. Um, with Dr. Paul Moran and Alex Hunt. They were, they were great guests, and and um, you know, uh, another one of my successful free three person podcasts, which uh, sound guy Karen loves those ones. Oh, look at the eye roll there. So um, and then the next one we backed up with was Tim Benson. Tim's uh, the managing director of Infinity Financial Consultants. Um, it's been in his, his his family for years, and what he's done is he's he's taken the the approach of of the multidiscipline practice and building that out. And he'll be quite honest with the trials and tribulations of you know talking to an accounting person is not the same as talking to financial planners, as an example. Then we're followed by just a juggernaut, you know, a, an insurance only specialist business called Ozbrokers Life. Um, with Ben Donald and his, uh, you know, incomparable um, GM, Shaun Shaw, who uh, we, we broke her podcast virginity and she did an absolutely hit it out of the park. Um, that business is a pure play life insurance business and and they assure me that there's sub 200 people who are just life insurance people and they're, they're of a massive scale. So it's interesting to see that one. Um, you mentioned Ben Nash and Pivot. Apart from being a founder of Ensemble, which we all all give him thanks for, that's why we're all here. Um, he's got some really interesting ways of thinking, and if you listen hard enough, everyone takes Ben as the front guy, but his happy place is in front of a spreadsheet. So, and absolutely, and then the last practice, another really quality multidiscipline practice, and the story here is quite cute, right? So Belinda, I think, was the second or third employee, and there were two. 
two, two blokes that, um, you know, Marshall and Jeff, and they've grown into their roles and grown into maturity. So I just thought I'd frame that up because probably were a miss of me earlier. Um, and with, with that there, um, what are, do you have any other ones that are running it like a business you might want to touch on? Yeah, yeah, I do. So, so we talk about this um, a lot in in providing that external assistance to firms, right? So, um, if we're working a firm with a firm, they're accessing our consulting services. They're saying, "Look, we are doing certain things really well, and we've got growth plans, or we've got efficiency plans, and we want to do things better." So, I think that culture of continuous improvement was absolutely a theme that really played through. Some of them didn't actually say those words, but you could hear in the what they were describing around how they are evolving their business. Everybody believes in this. You know, we we've got to find better ways to do things. That continual improvement aspect of the the business. You know, I love um, the whole notion of to pod or not to pod. You know, as far as I am running a pod structure, it's one of my favourite questions. Yeah, and, and and some people definitely love doing it, and some people are half in and half out, and I think they struggle. And some people are like, God no. So um, there's a few of them that have been running a pod. But what's your thoughts on 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 uh, creating efficiencies through a pod? And is there any of these sort of people uh, in the last five um, engine rooms that that stood out as far as um, running it like a business? Yes, yes. So the pod thing first, I think most of them use pods in, in this regard. And, and that's where, you know, they have some of them had an advisor, a power planner, client service manager. Others also had associate advisors that sat in. So we're seeing that as being a really great way to grow talent. But I think that comes down to making sure that there's ultimate responsibility for client files and delivery of work. Um, because if everything is pulled, um, I think you. I think there was a quote there from you. If if nobody's if everybody's accountable, nobody's accountable. We, we went through, through this. No quotes from me. Uh, <laughs> that was one of the government rules. But oh, the A word. Gold. <laughs> oh, the A word is the most powerful one. It Having sure accountability is. and getting the right people doing the right things at the right time. Yes. No matter which way you frame it, if you've yep. got accountability from the bottom to the top, from the edge to edge, you've got a chance. Yeah. If you don't, it just leaks. Yeah. And it's, so it's partly around the structure of your operating rhythm. So those pod structures, quite often those pods, it, it might have that, that kind of um, group that sit around the client, but then there's certain tasks that can be pulled. So it might be um, implementation, it might be administrative tasks that anyone can pick up that file and do it, but then it goes back in through a workflow. And that's the key, right? Like these businesses are having structured processes that is one way, same way, uh, every Everybody in the business uh, implements things. We have personality, we have relationships, but when it comes to actually getting work done and finalised, each one of those firms had worked out ways to capitalise on the best way to deliver services and then people follow that same process and backed up by the technology and automation wherever possible. And who do you think had the best cadence as far as all those things? What was your, what was your, your thoughts, maybe a, a cracking quote? So, so one of them, uh, who was that? Tim from Infinity. Now, he, uh, I, I would actually wrap up two of this. It's partly around the operating rhythm of their client, of their staff meetings and what they're talking about in focusing on WIP and so forth. But it's also one of the key elements of running it like a business, and that is know your numbers. And Roxy, I don't know how you manage this, but I am going to be slow in what I say this. I love his hot sheets. Let's play that one. How do you measure your operations? How do you know it's a good day? How do I know it's a good day? I have lots of little sheets I call hot sheets on like for hot sheets for financial planning, which I get at Monday at 12 o'clock, uh, productivity sheets for counting and lending I get hot sheets as well. So um, it's one page and it's got um, reviews, meetings, fee renewals, uh, lost clients, one clients and new business written. Would you call them your critical numbers? Oh, yeah. And we have a 15-minute by hate long meeting. So um, Zoom in, call in or be in the 15-minute meeting at 11 o'clock for advisors, I think 11.15 for lending and accounting after that. For those of you who play podcasts slightly faster than other people at 1.2 times, yep, um, he's locked in a hot shit. It's a hot sheet. So it's, it's, it's the most challenging linguistic part of our podcasts. Um, uh, if you know Tim... He's so full of energy. And you can imagine that 
Probably it was named like, you know, our daily sheets or something like that. And he's gone, we're calling them the hot sheets. And he's probably got little flames around them in his office. But uh, Tim, if you're listening, you know who you are, right? So is that what, what, what do you think there, Sue? Oh, look, I actually think it is hot shit, right? It's fantastic. <laughs> I'm glad that he's done it. Um, but, but what I see for firms is sometimes they just cannot get their fingers on that data. So when, when, when you're planning out strategies for a firm, when you're making some significant change, or if it's just around your operating rhythm, we know each of our advisors needs to be seeing this many people. We need to have this many um, client review or update meetings. We need to ensure that the turnaround time is X number of days whatever your critical numbers are, it's one thing to set your benchmarks to make sure that everything's running smoothly. But then if you can't get your hands on the data to actually track whether you're achieving that, then that's a real problem. Um, so I love the hot sheets. And he was talking to about their implementing, I think it was Revex as a new piece of um, software to manage the, uh, the revenue that's coming in uh, to the business. That's really important. So whether or not you are you are trying to grow um, and you're wanting to win a significant number of new clients or new referrals from a center of influence, whatever that is, or if it really is just about tracking the delivery of the promises that you've made so that you are ensuring that you're meeting your service standards, having a, an eye on those numbers, sharing it with the team, because this is the other thing too, Right. All of these firms have a practice manager. There's somebody that is responsible for for driving the the management of the business. But the people that are responsible for doing those things, so advisors should be responsible for the clients that they're seeing, these guys need visibility on that data as well because, you know, that A word again, the accountability piece, if they don't know what they're delivering, how can they stay accountable to what you're asking them to do? And, um, you know, in my various businesses, I always call them critical numbers. And there's normally five or, or six of these critical numbers and you live and die by them. And, 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 and they're just something that everyone knows like that. Um, in, in, in your role with Elixir or maybe your, your coach's roles, what's the, what's the languaging that you guys use? when you're engaging clients for that that style of critical number cadence. Exactly that, critical numbers. Um, there you go. And, and <laughs> we should have talked earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but, but interestingly, what makes up those critical numbers, exactly which critical numbers we track for each firm might vary um, because, it, you know, whether, whether it's a multi- Give us some examples. So one of my clients working with this morning, uh, I, I was out there this morning, uh, they are a multidisciplinary firm. So we're looking at not only, um, and, and for those guys, it's a, it's an update meeting. We don't do client reviews because that's looking in the rear vision mirror, whereas actually a great client review is looking forward and where are we going now where it's a progress meeting. So for the advisors, it's how many progress meetings they have. They've got an SMSF audit team. So it's around how many um, SMSFs are up to date and tracked and how many new uh, clients they've won. Uh, they've got referrals coming in from the accounting side of the business. So that's a, a, a multidiscipline or to the language that um, a lot of the these guys use the super firm. That might be different to just a pure financial advice business and they're just really looking at the their financial advisory numbers. So let's talk about multidiscipline firms. There's, there was two um, in, in the five there. There was the Evalesco team in Sydney and the Infinity team, which are in Sydney, but oh, sorry, in Brisbane, but are also in Sydney as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the, I suppose, the home truths um, uh, that, that Mr. Benson told me was that, that, that the way in which um, accountants think is different to the way financial th- planners oh, yeah. think. And he really needed that, that, that numbers as a base. But what, I, what jumped out at me with Belinda was just the dichotomy of leadership there and having the right people doing the right things. What was your take on, on that with Belinda and Evalesco? Yeah, so so a, a great business, and I love you know Belinda. I think she'd been there fifteen years, um, and and her role had evolved over time. You know, I think she started out with admin. She'd actually come out of a risk only firm, started out in admin. Fifteen years later, she's got a seat at the the leadership table with the 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 two guys. She's running the firm, and and we see that a lot. And what. What I find around that role of a practice manager, and it could be a practice manager, it could be operations manager, whatever people choose to call it, I think the key is not assuming that that person now is going to have the weight of the whole business on their shoulders. Right. So we, we see it quite often, usually most firms are started by a practitioner. They're a great advisor. The business grows. They end up running it and, and having a client load. And then they get to a, a critical mass stage where they can afford to have somebody in that operational management role. So they either 
put somebody on like Belinda or, or step somebody up in the role like Belinda um, or the uh, principal, and, and there's a couple of examples in these five, says actually I, I love the management side, not the client work, so I'll transition my clients. But they then have a, a rhythm and a way to get the, each other around the table to share the leadership responsibility, get the best of ideas from all of them, make critical decisions together to move the business forward. And and with Belinda in particular, there was an awesome quote um, that we might throw to you. I to there's something about how she interplays with the two founders. Is that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, let's do that one. Is. That's a good one. Um, and I love it too because, of course, they're getting external assistance in to run it as well. So let, let's throw to that, Kieran. Why don't we Why don't we hear what she said about the, uh, the consulting piece? So although you um, share AFSL, does your business have a board per se or is it just the, the senior leadership of you three that, that, that sort of make the decisions? Yeah, we've got this, uh, the, the three of us. Um, we've also um, in the last six months, six to 12 months, um, engaged with Encore Advisory. Um, so we've got Mark as part of our board as well, which we have identified as a leadership team has been a bit of a game changer um, for us as a group. Um, it just helps us stay on track, holds us accountable accountable far more than it ever did. Um, we've been able to set out project plans and that sort of thing. All the stuff that we just have in conversations and it would typically fall back on me to track and make happen, we've got someone else to, to help us push those along. Look, and a shout out to Encore and we'll put, give, put some details attached to this of, of who they are and hopefully they're still open for new clients because <laughs> they'll probably get some. Um, and look, I'm a mad fan of having uh, coaching. In fact, um, my current business uh, partner in VBP was my previous business coach as a financial planning um, owner. So uh, holding holding owners to account, remember the A word, accountability? Yeah. What what we've learned talking to practice managers is they've got to hold people technically below them in the org chart accountable, but the ones that do it well hold themselves and the people above them in the org chart accountable. Mm. Would you say that's your role? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's spot on. And it's only really come to light that that has been and become a clear focus since we've started working with Mark and Tom. So um, you're right. It's 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 It also demonstrates that um, – that getting getting someone else a third party or another lens in there, and I think she referenced um, uh, the the Encore team. Is that right? Encore, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, you know, shout out to those guys. It's um, yeah, uh, have, holding your, the best sports teams are well coached, and and you know, coming from a coach, I, I'm, I'm sure that that's something that you concur. Oh, I most certainly do. I, I think the best thing that a coach can bring is. Not only bringing everybody to the table, getting uh, um, uh, getting the ideas out in the table, helping them make the best decisions around the strategies that they want to implement, but it's then that accountability piece, as 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 Shan said, um, sorry, as Belinda said, is then being able to say, well, what are the things we're going to track? We want to bring us ourselves back to the table. If we've got any roadblocks, let's work out how we're going to get past them and just keep moving forward, so we don't have these. Talk fests where we we do an offsite and you know we have some great wine and everybody throws the the big ideas around the table but then we come back the next year and nothing's moved we're we're in exactly the same position and sorry Sue um one of the other things that you mentioned about running a, like a business was you can't be all things to all people yes and I'd really like your take on on um Ozbroker's life you know um just as a, a bit of background they're they're um they're one of the few well they're they're a financial planning firm. That get referrals from financial planning firms. Uh-huh. So, so increasingly, as Wolf practices, and I know there are a few other notable companies out there, and they know who they are, and I love you guys as well, and girls. Um, but, but the way in which they have become a specialist arm is is kind of another direction. So, you started off with saying that you know there's no one size fits all. Mm-hmm. And some are multidiscipline. We've just spent some time about the multidiscipline practices, but yep. some of them have chosen to be hyper. Specialized. So I just thought, what's your take on on that, and what did you learn from from Ben and Shan's um, podcast? Well, you know, Roxy, that's a really beautiful segue. That is the absolute connection between the running it like a business and then the capacity planning theme that we talked about, right? So, um, it, it, we we talk a lot about the fact that we know that the numbers of advisors in the profession have gone down. Where you know, where where 
that's been decimated. We're not having enough people come through to do their professional year. Even these changes with the the uh, education uh, recognition, we just we all know there's more clients that require advice than there are advices to give them. So one of the key challenges every firm is is faced with is how do we lift capacity per advisor? Um, even if it's not a high growth firm, even if they don't want to you know grow to 100 advisors like Ben Nash does. Those those advisors who are running great businesses want to keep it as a as a family run business. Do need to crack this code of how do I get my advisors to be more productive? And as a firm, how do we serve more clients? And one of the critical triggers or or um, door openers to that is making sure you got the right people doing the right roles in the business. So, Kieran, we might actually Kashan said some some gold around that. Why don't we play that? So the the start is to ensure that advisors can do as much client-facing work as possible. Obviously, that might be over the phone or Zoom, uh, but generally speaking, we want to keep the advisors advising, uh, engaging with clients and doing what they can. So the support team work extremely closely with the advisors. And when do they cut in? So when do they start? So our support team start as soon as the advisor meets with the client. So effectively, they may know prior to the meeting. If they don't, they'll know as soon as the meeting's over. They're introduced straight away. So they're always a second set of hands to catch them if they have any questions or need to go from there. And then the support team just ensure the entire process runs smoothly. We've got all A's across the business with our audits this year. So everyone's doing what they're supposed to do with a really robust, solid system that runs behind them. I love the second set of hands. You know, oh, it's just it, just it just puts that visual, doesn't it? You know, like, yeah. um, and, 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 and from a life insurance thing, like you do want that, don't you? Yes. Yeah. And it's, again, back to this, you know, working with pods or some different pool tasks is making sure nothing's falling through the cracks. It works for a workflow perspective, who's doing the task, but it also works from building this relationship around the client because what we do need is advisors spending as much time doing the client delivery work as possible because we know there's certain elements of services that you provide that have to be done by a licensed advisor uh, and their relationship uh, focused. So why would you even want them doing file notes if it takes them hours to to type with one finger on a keyboard? Why would you want them following up product providers when they get and got to sit on hold for two hours? And equally, why would you want the clients having to wait three hours for a callback from an advisor that's in back-to-back meetings when you've got a client service manager that knows the client just as well, that is beautiful on the phone, that is really friendly and can get their, their problem solved within a moment, right? And you know what? Um, I've just had a cursory glance over the five businesses that we're we're um, reviewing, and yep. all of them have global teams. Um, yes, uh, some of those global teams are with uh, the good people at VA Platinum, and some with VBP. But yep. every single one of them have made a decision to do that. I think, I think that's because um, most of these people aren't focusing on super high net worth. Clients, they're not looking at the sort of the ten million dollar, fifty grand fees, which which other practices do. So they need to be able to have a palatable entry point for their clients to to be able to to get into their business so they can grow with them. But yeah, that that, that concept of, of 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 having the right people in the global team, yeah, um, uh, it's not all the time. But when I re- looked at them, every single one, there you go. Eh? They do, yeah. And you know what? It it makes commercial sense. Um, You know, if you can have team members that can do a role for 30 grand a year um, as opposed to having to pay someone 80 grand a year in the extra on costs or whatever that is, commercially it makes sense. But also, you know, there's some key success factors for people to to pull that off. Um, And and one of the big things that was a common theme I saw is that, that these firms don't consider them to be outsourced staff. They consider them to be team members that happen to be located in the Philippines or in another country. They're working from home, they're working from an office, but they're remote and they work together as part of a team. And the only way to get the efficiencies of that and the scalability of that is coming back to what we talked about before with the consistency of these firms having one way, same way, we follow a process, we put every, build everything around with the client at the centre of it, and we deliver our advice and services in the most effective way as we can. And 
so I would see that as being a commercial um, success factor, but it's also um, quality of client delivery. It means that your CSMs and relationship people have more time to spend on those high value relationship based tasks, and somebody else can do some more of the admin stuff that that doesn't necessarily need to be manning the phones or any of those other elements. I think um, my comment on that is is that that the last part of um, the motivation, which is having the right talent doing the right things, was by far the driving. Force, um, you know, having been in all five hours of these ones, yeah. I don't think anyone mentioned the commercial um, impl- no, implications. I think it just meant that you know the 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 the, the talent crunch um, in Australia. It's the real. Fact that, yeah, the fact that also that 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 um, if you are an AR or a PY or a power planner or anyone, and you're in an inefficient business, it's just not fun, right? right. So so they've kind of like what comes first. The chicken or the egg or the horse and the cart. I will be anyway. We'll see how yeah. we'll have to work a bit more on these things. I've only got two <laughs> up my sleeve. Um, but if you don't build a team and have some people doing those repetitive, time-consuming jobs, um, and and make them feel like culturally this is really awesome. So there's it's the person who's on hold to the good people at um, Zurich who are sponsoring this podcast or, yeah. or, or one um, or, or, or Hub or whomever, right? Or the good people at CFS who sponsor the PY program for Ensemble Shout Out. Yes, there. Um, yeah. You know, if we don't have those people getting those questions and getting those answers, we don't have power planners, we don't have advice delivery, we've got no revenue, we've got no hours. So so, so there is commercial outcomes, but but from what I've, I've, I've sort of ascertained is that it doesn't even form part of how they feel the relationship is managed, to be brutally honest. Yeah, that, that word relationship, it really is. They're, they are humans that are a part of their team. You know, I, I love the, um, I think it was Tim was saying it's it's one of the performance rewards for the great team members on the Australian team that get to go over to the Philippines and catch up at the the client conference and, and meet their people face to face and and build those relationships. Um, so I, I think all of these elements come together to start lifting that capacity of the advisor. Um, and look, you know, some clients, I know some advisors will say, oh, you know, we maxed out about 80 to 100 clients. We can't see any more than that. Others will be 150. You know, we're trying to encourage firms to say, look, we know it's a finite resource, advisors, and we're wanting to grow more. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the PY program for, from CFS because we, we want to figure out a way to get more um, advisors into the profession. Although one thing, and I hope he, he won't be upset by this, I'm sure he won't, Paul. Paul made an off-the-cuff remark of if it's hard in a small business to bring on a PY person because they're not productive, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. It, it's, it's, it's true. And I think when PY first came out, there was, you know, we were still sort of in that, um, you must do this, you must do that. And people were a bit gun shy around, you know, the extent to which they could help clients. But I think as we've settled in um, to it, the, they've realized that there is some productivity that can be done. Plus also shout out, I mean, if you're a, um, if you're a self-licensed business, of which you know, there are lots of them, in fact, I think four of the five, with the notable exception being Ausbrokers that are licensed through Australian Unity, shout out yeah. to both Ausbrokers, ASS listed company, and Australian Unity, 156-year-old AFSL. Yeah. Um, they, um, we've got some scaffolding now. So there is some scaffolding around the PY. Um, yes. So I think it is starting to work. Now, I was also then thinking, um, you know, getting getting some – the manifestation of once we get the capacity right, yep. once we give these bloody advisors, and I was a CFP, you know, probably Australia's worst for 20 yeah. odd years. So now I've got some extra hours. How do we serve the clients better? And who oh. does a good job at that? Yeah. Well, I loved one of the things I, I want to throw to Ben actually for this because. So Benny Nash or Benny Donald? Benny Nash. Benny Nash. Okay, well, I did that to you again. <laughs> I have to rename one of them. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Kieran. Um, so Ben had a really interesting way of separating out the responsibilities for the different roles within the business. Um, so we might might actually throw to that one, and then uh, and then we'll come back and have a chat about that. Uh, look, I think w- one thing that is a little bit different with how we do things at Pivot is that we separate out our sales function and our advice function pretty distinctly. So, so separate people even? Separate people. Oh. So I think that advisors need to be able to sell. I think everybody needs to be able to sell. They need to be able to sell ideas. They need to be able to get their point across. They need to sell people to 
you know, particularly with clients, getting them to do the things that they want and need to do to get the outcomes that they want. But one of the things that I realized in growing the team is that it's actually quite a different skill set from for what you want from an advisor and what you want from a salesperson. And for for an advisor, at least at Pivot Wealth, we need someone that likes people, sure, but like someone that's into the detail around technical strategies and supporting clients, you know, f- nailing their file notes and making sure their SOAs are rock solid and all of those sorts of things. That's not necessarily, in fact, it's not actually the same as someone that thrives on, you know, building relationships and selling people, just talking to people all day, every day. We actually, for an advisor, we're looking for someone that's probably a little bit more detailed orientated, maybe even a little bit more introverted, that is going to nail all of that detail so that the clients can rest easy knowing that we're all over that stuff behind the scenes. Whereas for a salesperson, we want someone that can talk career off and just loves being in conversations, but we don't really want or need someone that needs to be super detail orientated. In fact, you probably don't even want someone that's super detail orientated because when people are buying, they're buying, you know, at an emotional level, at a bigger picture level, rather than an ultra detailed level, at least in my experience. He's good at articulating things, isn't he? Isn't he? He really is. Um, and, and what I love about this piece is that there, there's so many so many bits that I could talk about here, right? One, recognizing natural skill sets and personality types, right? Recognizing the value in different people's um, uh, skills. So, so yeah, if you're awesome with the spreadsheet and and if you are a brilliant uh, technical technician, uh, then then there's a place for that, and and we want to leverage that and and do it the best make that work the best way for the clients. By the same token, there's some of the elements of a client engagement process that you don't necessarily need to have that that technical proficiency to deliver. And this comes back to having this team-serviced approach. I know, and I went and checked this actually because I was thinking as I was listening to Ben, I'm thinking, oh, I'm not sure how happy the clients would be to know that they've been put in front of a sales manager so they can make the sale. But as I suspected, um, they're actually called a relationship manager. So, so, so Pivot introduced people as being, you know, you may talk to your relationship manager. But I know Ben was talking to, you know, people behind the scenes within the profession. And 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 you know what. If I go back to sort of one of the iconic financial advice practices, the Paul Clitheroe IPAC yes. business and the, who did the money show and is probably the reason why people understand what we do uh. back in the late 90s, he had a similar model. He, yeah. had, a, he had a similar model um, where he had some people because, you know, you've got your left and right brains and, and, uh-huh. and some people need, some clients need just a little bit of motivating to get started. But yeah. then once they've started, though, they're going to go deep into detail. So I think what Ben's saying is, is that that they get a bit of a feel for who is going to work best with with those clients, and he has a lot of, um, as he quote, he has a lot of tech um, yeah. clients. So you got to think. I mean, they might be all trendy and and uh, you know turtlenecks and whatnot, but their day job is pretty pretty detailed. Yeah. So so you're going to need some some pretty pretty robust sort of detailed orientated. Um, uh, a sort of ongoing relationship, people, um, which are quite often is a counterpoint to the salespeople. Now I know which one I sit in, Sue. So um, <laughs> I think it's, I might uh, be able to guess which camp that <laughs> might be, Rosie. <laughs> we can cut that bit out, Kerry. You know that's sort of how we roll, isn't it? So, 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 and what else are your thoughts about pivot? Oh, look, I, I love what Ben's building there um, and his gorgeous wife. I love on the website too. She's called the Boss Lady. I, I love it. Um, and 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 I observe in listening to the way Ben describes his business, he's absolutely building now for scale. So even though I think when you recorded it, was he up to? Oh, I should have written this down in my notes. Um, he was talking about getting Just to the sound point of confident having a hundred. Podcast, Sue. Just sound <laughs> confident. We're on a podcast. He, he said he's got three advisors right <laughs> we'll now, and he's going to get we'll to okay. <laughs> I mean, he's building for getting to the point of having 100 advisors. And so rather than going, oh, we're just going to say yes to everybody and then backfill our, our problems later, he, he actually talked about the fact that he they got to that point. He's got brilliant marketing. As you say, he's a prolific writer. They've, they've got these sales funnels that are converting um, digital leads off TikTok uh, that come in through their process that, that people are met where they're at in that 
process to be able to get more information to move forward. But what that does is it drops out of the bottom of the funnel a whole bunch of really qualified leads. He got so many at one point that they had to to pull back and stop so that they could serve the people that they were getting through. And so now he's got this beautiful infrastructure where he knows who's doing what in the advice process. He knows who he's recruiting. He knows how many and when he has to bring people on. That is a really curated way of building a scalable business. And I know he's like got little duck legs, you know, going like mad underneath the surface, um, but he's he's doing it, building it with intention, which I love. Yeah, and look, that's part, I think he calls that smart money accelerator. So yeah. they do have a, they do have a, 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 they, their, their fees are, um, uh, are solid, you know, they think it's $13,000, yeah. um, but they don't, they don't keep rolling them every, you know, every year they've got to go back and, and justify. And some years people will stay on that and some years there won't be as much work. So they're yeah. hyper transparent. And I think that comes across in that. But, but to it be does. fair, um, all these practices, uh, are, um, are, are very professional in the way in which they're engaging. They sure um, are. Their, their, their clients and, and when I think about the ongoing management um, of, of these clients, I kind of think, well, you know, what does it mean by servicing a client better? So, so in one end of the spectrum, Ben Nash is very much, we're going to do a lot of work and you're going to pay for it today. And then mm-hmm. when we get to the bit where we don't do much work, you don't pay for it at the time. And then when we do it, right? Yeah. And then you've got um, uh, Ozbrokers, they're like, well, we don't do any work until if, in relation to their partners. Their wolf partners will bring them in as the surgeon to come in as part of, um, you know, a whole family office where they're doing the risk. They come in, they do best practice, they set that piece of risk up, they then work with the partner, you know, and they work to manage the ongoing, you know, craziness around renewals and life insurance yeah. and whatnot. So, and claims, I think yes. they mentioned a specific claims manager. Correct, correct, and yeah. and um and and just some 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 really confronting statistics coming out of COVID mm. with mental health claims and and a Deloitte survey, which I'm, I've got another podcast dropping in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to quote the same thing. But there's a recent Deloitte uh, survey saying that over the last, I think, let's say two years, right? Say it confident, no one knows. Over the last <laughs> two years, there's one million less insured people in Australia. It's gone from four to three million. That's that is just that's frightening. Incredible. That's frightening, yeah. right? So, so yeah. um, you know, making sure you're doing that and delivering that 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 community service is very important. Yes, and and to your point there, Roxy, it's it's it building out the the best way to serve clients better. It depends on the different business that we're talking about. We've, we've talked about the whole capacity planning to have the right people doing the right things, and we saw that through so many of the firms. But it was also then making sure that the client's needs are met in the best way possible. So there's the there's the soft element element of it in that you know people have a relationship with the client service manager. They don't just have to speak to the advisor when they need something. But then the pure um, technical aspect of it, when somebody needs insurance advice, you know, there was one of the firms that had an insurance specialist uh, and they worked in-house and I think that was only uh, in the last two years, but already he's, you know, he's showing incredible knowledge and expertise that they couldn't do without him. Um, to, you know, the the Ospokers model where people then uh, bring in the specialist when they need to, they refer the client on. But I think what it comes down to is – being really clear around the types of clients that a firm is choosing to work with. And, you know, everybody's heard for years the concept of the ideal client, right? Um, In practice, when we work on this with firms, you know, I I always talk with quotation marks and I think it's the ideal client. And I think people think, you know, ideal is like, you know, rainbows and unicorns, it's not actually possible to do because people will create and we help them do it, right? Let's create an avatar of the perfect client that you want and let's be very specific about who it is that you're trying to create your business around. The act of doing that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to niche down really tight, but what it does mean is that you can create your service offering and the way that you deliver. So, in theory, it sounds great, right? But the practical reality is you know, people will often create the definition of the type of client that they're building the business around, but they've got an existing practice already. So a lot of their current clients might not necessarily meet the definition of the people they want to build the future of the, the firm with. But the thing that really struck out across all of these firms that we talked about uh, that were in the podcast is that they're some of them 
were quite niche. Some of them were fairly broad, but they all had this view of we don't have to be all things to all people. Right. I don't necessarily need to niche really tight, but we're okay if clients coming asking for things that don't suit the value proposition that we've got, they don't, we don't need to win every client. And that also extended to staff. Like quite a few of them talked about how important it is to ensure that they're culturally aligned with their people, that you get great people, you let them do a great job and trust them and 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 they will excel but it doesn't mean everybody is the right fit for every business. And I think that's that's really, yeah, important. It's, it's, it's horses for courses. Now, speaking of courses, did you see what I did there? <laughs> oh, I saw what you okay. did there. <laughs> <laughs> we were chatting off her air and, you know, I got this um, – I got wrangled into this uh, engine room podcast. Uh, the the CEO and founder of Ensemble, Clayton Daniel, who we all love, he kind of – he said, look – I think what the industry is missing is talking about the business of the business and um, and having a lens and being quite, you know, agnostic across tech and, 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 and everything. And um, and so about beginning of the year, like literally nine months ago, we said, we're going to do this engine room one. We're going to promote practice management. And, um, you know, I ran into you at a conference um, in, in August and you're like, you know, I'm doing this practice management course. And I'm like, when did you do that? Did you copy me? When, so tell me, when did you when did you start the practice management course? <laughs> we launched it about nine months ago, so it must have been about the same time that you that you launched the podcast. And because you know, we so many of the firms that we work with, you know, we come in, we help them define strategy, uh, we help them, you know, create their growth plans or their management plans, and then things fall down because they don't get executed or they don't have the bandwidth because the principals are, you know, too busy with their client load and they have people come up through the business that are really excellent team members, but nobody has ever been able to train them in how to be a practice manager. Half the time they're employed as a practice manager in a firm where nobody in that firm even knows what should be on the job description of the practice manager. It's like, here you go, let's run this droid and see what happens. So we were finding our coaches were doing a lot of work um, with staff members of the firms we work with. And then we went, oh, you know what? There's got to be a better way to do this. There's a there's a lack of um, training for us to improve these skill sets. No one else is doing it. Let's do it. We'll, we'll invent it. So we did. Well, and, and look, um, uh, as I've mentioned, um, you know, a lot of – when I've asked, I ask about what's the vision of the future to practice managers and – and um, you know, quite often they they're very complimentary of ensemble and of course, and um, of, of, of of what they do, and 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 they all will kind of sort of say, well, it'd be really good if we had like a bit more of a a space or a bit more where we were talking our common language, as much as as much as we can put up with our ARs, to, you know, going on about which is the best investment strategy, and here's my fancy whiteboard, blah, blah. which by the way, as a reform CFP, is our happy space. Um, <laughs> there is probably um, you know a fair bit. A fair, a fair gap in 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 some structured training and potentially um, uh, look what we might do. Here is we might pop Sue's Sue's link in there and probably so. I'd love you to chat with um, the, the the ensemble team about you know how how we because we're we're all about promoting that and why that yes. is is that that it takes a village to raise a business or whatever it was yes. a tribe right tribe to, I love it's that. a village get in there right. But um, if you are starting right now. You don't have to be. You don't have to want to work your way through to be the client-facing advisor. You know, I'm a big fan of the fact that there's some really powerful COOs and general managers of practices that I've interviewed, and I am going to interview, um, yep. who basically run their business. They're the ones that deal with the suppliers. They're the ones that the the BDMs nervously present to around will their practice take their portfolio. You know, times have changed, so. Um, you know, I'm very much, very much that that would work really well. And the course that you've, you've got there, um, you can have a look at it. It's in the links. Um, and what I'd like to, I suppose, finish with is, look, it's wonderful to, to, to bring you on and start unpacking. Um, I'm looking forward to, to, you know, rolling different sorts of guests and different sorts of insights. But I definitely know that the, the five quality practices that we unpack today will really appreciate the commentary, and I hope that the listeners out there sort of really get this infectious kind of, um, uh, I suppose, catch catch what we're all about, which is let's build the business of the business. Yeah, let's build some decent platforms. Let's execute right, and let's move past 
the headwinds for the last 10 years. Let's put the friggin' spinnaker up. Yeah, baby. The opportunities are phenomenal. Absolutely. And with that, I'd love to thank you, Sue, um, for unpacking. As always, Kieran Sound Guy, another quality one with all of us stumbling around with our quotes. Um, and we'll be back to regular, regular engine rooms next week. Um, Sue, thank you very much for your time. Have a great thank day. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. Cheers.